Hi, this is Jay Washburn. And I'm Joe Bondosky. And this is Start Writing. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about elements of a happy ending. So in our last episode, we talked about elements of the end. And so this is going to be a little bit more specific about some of the tweaks and changes that are different and specific to a happy ending as opposed to one of the other types. So in that episode, we covered the seven different types of ending you can have for a story. And like we said, we would uh, then break that down into individual episodes. And uh, so this is the first. And I think this is, this is definitely the most common ending you're going to get in a book. Hmm. A, lot of, you know, a lot of readers, this is... This is this is how they want their experience to end, and uh, they can get a little disgruntled if this is not what they get. <laughs> so, so a lot of this will focus on the character arc uh, that deals with uh, not what they want, but what they need, but not a lot, 100%. But most happy endings involve that kind of character arc. So, But I did listen to our episodes talking about that kind of character arc. And uh, there's a lot here that's going to be very different. So I even listened to it. I was like, there's not much I can use in those old episodes here. <laughs> so, okay. So, again, our source material, again, is going to be the movie Cars, uh, with exception of the few uh, points that we can't pull examples from Cars. But we've tried to pull as many of our examples from that movie as possible. Just one, it's it hits all the big points on this kind of ending. And two... It's a movie, it's really short, and you can watch it. And three, it's something we've used before, so if you've referenced the source material, you're at least familiar enough for the examples we pull out. Mm. Why do we write and like happy endings? <laughs> uh, so as, we, as, as readers uh, grow to care and love a character, they want good things for them, just like they want good things for their friends and family and their celebrity crushes. So... A happy ending gives us that feeling for the character. It also taps our own feelings of empathy. As we imagine those we care about getting good things and enjoying them, we get to enjoy that experience with them, right? So that's that's kind of the core of the happy ending. And while they're so popular, right? You get to yeah. walk away feeling good <laughs> because they're feeling good. Um, so let's break this down to its components. One of the big things that, that almost everybody agrees on is it's not perfect. Happy endings are not perfect, unless they're for little kids, right? Mm -hmm. Little kids get happily ever after. But uh, once you get into to YA or older, they usually recommend that the ending not be perfect because characters have had to make choices along the way and they've had to make sacrifices and decisions they've made have had consequences and that's not all magically cleaned up in the happy ending. So even if you look at all the Harry Potter books... There's always a price paid by somebody oh, along yeah. the way, you know. <laughs> along the way, there's a lot of people that Harry cares about that die, that dies or things that he doesn't get, right? In book one, he dreams about like Quidditch Cup, but he doesn't win it in book one. I think it's like by mm. book three that he actually wins the cup. And the interesting thing is like the Quidditch Cup is part of Hogwarts every year, but Harry never wins it again. The Voldemort stuff is so consuming, he can't focus on Quidditch and, you know, he can't play well. And so that falls by the wayside. Um, so with every, you know, along the way. So uh, with with Lightning McQueen, um, the thing he has always wanted is the Piston Cup and the deal with Dynaco. And he That's doesn't like a, a sponsorship. He yeah, wants, he wants to be sponsored because yeah. he's so famous. Yeah, so successful. And he doesn't get either of those in the movie. He to, to follow through on the lessons he's learned, to follow his belief on the things that will really make him happy. He has to give up both of those, right? And so even though we have a very happy ending in Cars, it's not perfect, right? The dream he's always had died along the way. <laughs> so um, now there is a, there is a point where uh, Dinoco actually comes over and still offers him the sponsorship. But uh -huh. again, he turns them down. Because part of his lesson is, you know, about and and is recognizing the people who supported him and helped him get there, mm -hmm. and one of them was Rusty's, and so he decides to stick with them. Uh, so, so his values have changed. Yeah, his values have changed. No. So that's that's part of setting up just another dilemma to solidify the character change there. But again, the the ending is not perfect. He doesn't get the friends and the success and the recognition and the cup and all of it. He doesn't get it all. Pieces of it are specifically given up mm. to achieve the things he now believes in. Mm. 
Well, and I think any good story has choices that are trade-offs. You can have this in exchange for that. Yeah. You can't have them both. And so and that choice makes it a good story, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's part, like uh the, the, real life is complicated and we all kind of have to make sacrifices along the way. And part of making sure that a happy ending really resonates with the audience is that imperfection that sacrifice because then it's more believable to the audience and we connect to it better be like yeah he earned it you know he yeah. made the choice and he got it mm. so um so and and of course you're always going to want to wrap up your other subplots and again happily but also keep in mind this bittersweet element uh so sally wants the old 66 route to come back to life right so that the, the town can, can be what it was before in its heyday. And that's not what happens. The highway stays there. The mm. cars continue to use it. They do get a boost in tourism because McQueen sets up his racing headquarters there. But 66 never comes back to life. And that was her dream. And, and that's not what she gets. But she does mm. get something that is still happy. So well, And her victory, having the tourism, is because... He made his sacrifice, or is no? That, is so that, he puts wait. his headquarters there at the end, which brings in tourists who want to see where Lightning McQueen is training and everything. Mm -hmm. So, so it brings in a burst of tourists. Yeah, that I way. guess I'm saying, did he have to give something up for her to get that? Uh, not specifically. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a kind gesture that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he he did this just because he liked her, you know? yeah. and he likes Radiator Springs. That's where he found his home. <laughs> so, but. But again, it's an imperfect one. Mm. So that one specifically doesn't have sacrifice, but it's still not that perfect ending that they wanted, right? Yeah. So uh, another thing is to avoid last minute tangents. So suddenly developing subplots at the, you know, the, the end of that third act in, in a four act structure, right? The end of third act, you're not going to want to suddenly start developing all these new subplots because it then doesn't feel like everything's colliding into a single big climax it feels like it's spreading out again yeah. and that can take away some of that energy and that tension and that momentum that's driving towards that last point let's say you have a tangent that needs to be in book one in order to set up something for books two and three is the third act like could you do that tangent there or when when would so you put that tangent there? i think i think usually what you want to do is is your all your subplots should probably go in act two and then sometimes, if you want to be hooking into the next story, you put that in Act 4. We have the climax, we have the resolution, and then we get the little yeah, after. Yeah, it's hook. like, oh, don't forget about this. Yeah. Don't forget. <laughs> but yeah, and so a lot of, a lot of uh, editors and, and writers have said that it can kill your tension, put in those last-minute tangents. He says, yeah. get your, establish your subplots, and then start bringing everything together. Hmm. Uh so, hints, this is kind of something we've covered in various features uh, of the story. Um, just, you know, building, that, back building those, those different pieces. Um, so, put the hints in. So, even if you get to the end of the book, like uh, with, with, uh, with, with my latest novel, um, there's a scene where the protagonist and, and uh, one of the other characters are trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out who's behind something and uh, where they're at and everything. They're trying to track them down. And uh, I know Jay and a couple of the beta feeders will point out and be like, I don't know how they're coming to this conclusion. It doesn't feel like they should have enough information. And so I went back into the other drafts and I added like one or two sentences into like three parts of the book where there was just a piece of evidence seen by one of those two characters. Mm -hmm. So they would have a little bit more information in that last meeting awesome. and be more likely to reach that conclusion. So the hints weren't there in the, in the first draft, or, I, or I, at least the, the beta draft that I sent out. But the beta reader said, hey, I just felt like it came out of nowhere. And so you go back and you put the hints in, and then it doesn't feel like it comes out of nowhere. Be like, no, no, I know exactly where they got all those bits and pieces along the way. So beta readers are great for this. I mean, initially you're going to want to plan these in there, but the readers might not get it, and a beta reader can point that out for you. Being like, hey, I didn't feel like I was. they, they should have known this or they should have reached this conclusion here. Mm. So not enough hints there. Uh, so uh, the storyline in, in Cars that really has a lot of hints that build up to it is the story with Doc. 
And so there are several scenes where we get all these hints from him. And the first time we see him, he comes into the courtroom. He takes one look at Lightning McQueen and wants nothing to do with him. Mm-hmm. He's going to throw the case out. He's a race car. He doesn't want anything to do with this guy. Just and so immediately, there's yeah. something about him and race cars, mm-hmm. right? And uh, then the second time is when McQ- he makes a deal with McQueen to race him. And Doc's a really old car at this point. And everybody's like, you got to be crazy. And he's completely confident and totally relaxed about this race. Right? And then he just lets him drive off the edge. And then they have to fish him out. Um, yeah. And then later he's seen just racing on that track himself. And so there's, there's several hints before we learn that he was this famous uh, race car. Uh, of course, we've mentioned this many times before, no deus ex machina. And again, we've even talked about, it's, it's more than just not having, you know, some divine or, or bigger power come in and save everybody. It's about making sure that the protagonist makes the decision that defines the ending. And so, I, this was an example I thought up for cars. So, let's say that, uh, the race is being held at a, and the t- track is all dirt. They've changed the venue. Now it's all dirt. And so McQueen... Wait, this is a hypothetical? This is a hypothetical. So this would be a, a form of deus ex machina. The race is being held on a track that's all dirt, which relates to earlier in the story. McQueen has learned how to race on dirt. It's one of the things he's learned. And so it feels kind of connected to the story that way. And McQueen wins because he knows to race on dirt and the other two don't. Right. The problem with that, and, and what makes this Deus Ex Machina, is McQueen does not choose to race on dirt. Hmm. That wins him. The race director does. That's not a choice driven by our protagonist. That's a choice driven by a different character. In fact, one who would be even off screen. Right. Yeah. And so that makes it Deus Ex Machina. Uh, an outer force has intervened to ensure that a protagonist wins. Hmm. Um, so yeah. So that's that's that's. Uh, the deus ex machina hypothetical being like, you know, it's got yeah. this, these choices have to be driven by a protagonist. Um, as always, we mention this all the time. Genres have rules and they are different for each genre and you've got to follow them. Um, so we're not going to go into them here. You need to look them up for your genre. Hmm. So, it, and, and no one has more rules about happy endings than romance. <laughs> Nice. So you got to be careful. Now, this next point is going to feel like useless, but I'm going to talk about kind of my own experience. And that is be creative. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and, I, and if I'm honest with myself, rarely will I brainstorm multiple ideas for an ending. But if we look at cars, as you can see the story unfolding, it's easy to see, oh, he learns to let people help him. They help him at the race. He wins the Piston Cup. There's Dinoco. It's easy to see how the story could have unfolded that way. Mm. And so I imagine what happened was they're sitting in the room brainstorming. They said, let's think of a different ending. And one of the first things they would, uh, would probably throw out is, let's, let's make it the opposite. What happens if he doesn't win the cup? How do we make that ending work? Mm. Right? And I think what, what you're yeah, looking and at... by work, how do we make that happy? How do we make that Yeah, how do we make that right? the happy, victorious ending? How does yeah. that feel like a victory? And because that's a big surprise, right? Because the whole show looks like, oh, he's going to win it, right? He's learned to depend on people. He got people to help him in Radiator Springs. They show up and they help him in the race. Be like, it's, he's going to win the cup and he doesn't. Mm-hmm. And that's actually a really big surprise and it's a good one. But in the brainstorming session, they ask the hard questions, right? So this is the Asian in, ending we envisioned. He's going to win the Piston Cup with the help of all these people. And that's what makes him great. Mm-hmm. And he learns his lesson. And so then you, you ask, the hard question here is, how do we make that work if he doesn't win? And so one of the things you can do is look at your ending and say, this is what I plan happening. What if I have the opposite happen? Right? How could I make that work? Because that's going to be the big surprise. But if you can make that work, then you get this fantastic, you know, interweaving. So, and, and part of a brainstorming is to come up with you know, a few different ideas that no one will see coming. And if you really work them, then they can work out really well and you get both the surprise and the good elements of the ending. And so, you know, be creative. I really encourage you to, one, brainstorm at least seven or eight ideas. And two, ask the hard question. The ending you have in mind, 
Think about the opposite happening and how does that come out as victory? Yeah, and I think the tweaking it into a victory is important. You don't want the tragedy of Lightning McQueen as a story because <laughs> no one's going to like that. So they, yeah. they take this such a negative thing or could have been and make it really victorious. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the next thing is building the ending out of the characters. And that is uh, try looking at the character arc and deriving the climax out of of that character so we've talked about settings and i'm not going to go into it really deep but you can have that setting be born out of the character conflict or or the character arc but also the climax itself and so let's take a if we take a look at the the race with lightning mcqueen um because of the type of race car that he is even though the race is held in a different place the track is identical And this is important in really bringing the climax out of his character because we get to see him make all the choices he did in the first race and this race. And we see how each one is different. But the setting is identical. The events taking place, having to go in and get the tires changed and all that. All those are identical. And so we see just how different each choice is in this race than they were in the race before. And so that kind of builds that climax out of his character arc very clearly there. So, yeah, so not just working on the setting. Now, here it is the setting, but that's just because it creates this great venue for showing the character. And, uh, yeah, so building that that climax out uh, of the character arc itself. Mm. Another one is don't surprise just to shock. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go really hard into the rule of surprise versus suspense, um, but I'm going to cover it really briefly uh, in, in case you didn't hear that episode. So the general rule is three surprises in a story, but novels vary in length, and so I think you more get is uh, two per 50k words is about the number of surprises you can get. Mm. And the balance here is important because suspense is based on, essentially, you see two trains racing towards each other on the track. And that suspense is the feeling of watching that, knowing they're going to collide with each other. And surprise... Wait, wait, knowing knowing they're going to collide, that's suspense? That's suspense. Or wondering whether they'll... Su- no, 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 well, you expecting them to collide. Let's mm-hmm. say expecting them to collide. That's suspense. You're like, it's going to be terrible. I can't look away. Mm-hmm. Right, that's suspense. Uh, whereas surprise is when something suddenly happens. So let's say suddenly a herd of uh, cattle come charging down and knock one of the trains off the track and they get run over by the other train. That's a surprise. But here's what happens. Is if there are too many surprises in a story, then the audience ceases to believe the suspense. So the next time we see these two events headed towards collision, we don't believe. They'll collide. And so there is no suspense. We're like, man, it's not going to happen. Because it never happens. Right? Not only that, but now we expect a surprise. Because something crazy is coming. And now it doesn't feel that surprising anymore. And so that's what that balance is about. If you throw too many surprises in the story, the surprises stop working and the suspense stop working. And suspense pulls a story along much better than surprises, right? You can pull a reader on just endlessly with suspense. Like that's, that's the whole idea of, of a cliffhanger. A cliffhanger is not about surprise. Cliffhanger is about suspense. That's what keeps them going back. And so, of the of the emotions, that's the stronger of the two. People tend to remember surprise moments more, but suspense is what keeps them coming back. Yeah. So, so you're not going to want to surprise them just to surprise them because you're messing with suspense every time you surprise. So, unless it serves a very specific purpose and you're really planning it out, go for suspense. Um, so when Lightning McQueen gives up the Piston Cup to help King, it's a surprise, right? Uh, because, uh, it's already been illustrated he's letting other people help him. And, and the Piston Cup is the thing he's always wanted. But when he stops at the finish line, it's a shock. 
and then when he flashes back to Doc's accident, then goes to help King, the surprise makes perfect sense, right? Wait, so uh, explain the logistics of that ending. So he is about to cross the finish line. He slams on his brake, he f- and, and King has been hit, and he's crashing. King is just a competitor? Yeah, he's, right? a, he's, the, he's the reigning champion, but he's getting old. Mm. And uh, so McQueen slams on his brake. He has this flashback of all the stuff, he, the old newspapers he saw about uh, Doc. Uh, and then he goes and he gets King. So he's worried the King is going to leave on a crash and, like, Become a dud, like a, yeah. a has-been after that, unless yeah. he helps him out. Okay. Um, but yeah, and, it, and it's because of that connection to Doc that that surprise works. Mm. So if we don't have the Doc storyline at all, and that happens, it comes out of nowhere, and it's unreal, right? Mm. It, it, the audience doesn't accept it. They're like, no, why would he do that? It doesn't make sense, right? Mm. But because of that relationship with Doc, and so part of that is, is maybe you throw in this really big surprise, and it is too much, then you can go in and back build, right? Be like, okay, maybe he meets this old race car, and learns yeah. his story, and now there's a reason in his head to go get him when it happens. Yeah. Hmm. So... Uh, so we covered this in, in the elements of the end. I just wanted to mention again briefly here. They need to earn or deserve the ending they receive. Uh, this goes for all heroes and villains and protagonists, antagonists, and, and sub-characters, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about, you know, at the end of Mean Girls, you don't get to shoot the Mean Girls. It's too much. They don't deserve <laughs> that. And this, at the same time, you know, at, at the end of James Bond, you don't invite him to the dance and snub him because he deserves far more than that, right? <laughs> So, yeah, so making sure that they deserve what they get at the end. Um, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, and then uh, in, in Cars, after giving up the kit, Piston Cup to help King, McQueen is still offered sponsorship with Danico. Um, but once again, he chooses this. But that offer of that, that sponsorship by Danico is really emblematic of what he deserves. Right? He deserved to win. And he could have won. But he gave mm-hmm. that up. That's cool. it. I'm gonna skip that last one. Oh. <laughs> so, anything else from your end? No, that's awesome. Gotta go watch the ending of Cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to support the show, check out one of our books or leave us a review on whatever platform you uh, listen on. Tell uh, tell your author friends, and, and if they're having a problem, maybe recommend one of our episodes. We have done a lot of episodes. <laughs> And they're they're quality. Joe does great research on this stuff. Well, I hope so. It's awesome. (laughs) It's good stuff. All right. So that is Elements of a Happy Ending. And uh, next uh, month we'll have uh, the next kind of ending you can do in a story. Okay. uh, One final note. Uh, Lori Poom, if you remember, she is a uh, StoryGrid uh, certified editor. Uh, She contacted me about something called the Writer's Craft Summit. So it's going to be her and Sean Coyne and a bunch of writers uh, are doing a uh, various teaching seminars on various aspects of craft. Um, initially, it was free, but she got me the email late enough that I, I, I couldn't plug it anywhere where you would still be able to access it free. But if it is something that interests you, um, particularly maybe if you've read the Story Grid or if you follow the podcast, you've probably heard of it already. Um, but uh, Sean Coyne is a very famous editor, and his book is uh, one of the, the better rated and more detailed books on writing craft. Um, so if you're interested in, in getting a, a kind of a, a video teaching session from him, then you can check out the uh, Writer's Craft Summit. Um, and then I think they have various passes, whether you want to see specific uh, trainings by specific people or all of it, all, all at once. And so she asked me to mention that, and uh, I said I'd be happy to let everybody know as we are a craft-specific podcast. And uh, so, yeah, as always, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, feel free to email in and let us know if you want us to try and do uh, an episode on anything specific. I know this series was kind of launched by Brian Allen's uh, email, and I've recently gotten a few more uh, emails that we're going to do episodes on as well once we finish this series on endings. 
So, yes, if you want to email us, it's jbndoski at gmail.com. Uh, I'm going to try and remember to put this in the notes for the podcast, or you can visit the website and email from there. That's joseph-bendoski.com, and you can either click on the Start Writing section or just backslash start-writing, and that will take you to that section of the website.